So we have um, entered into this, this series um, leading up to Easter next week, uh, this kind of mini journey, if you will, journey to the cross. Um, and, and today is, is interesting in, um, in this sense, um, as we celebrate Palm Sunday, uh, and we got the palms around and the singing and whatnot, and the kids leading uh, the, the parade <clears throat> that almost got, you know, uh, out of control. Um, <laughs> glad there was no injuries in here. Uh, but, you know, as it's a, it's a joyous time to celebrate. Um, it's a reminder of, of the, the celebration, the, the triumphal entry that Jesus had uh, into Jerusalem, but it's also it's also a little bit of a of a kind of mis, misnomer, if you will, um, when you think about the way Jesus came in and the response of the people and how that relates to today's uh, sermon, where we are. Um, uh, this 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 entry uh, of Jesus preparing to come in and. Uh, you know, he chooses a donkey to ride on, a, 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 a donkey that has never been written before. And, uh, and a lot of folks might wonder, like, what? Why, why, would, why would Jesus choose a donkey? Why not like a horse? Why, why not something that's more uh, noble? And of course, on this side of salvation, on this side of the story, we have a lot of understanding about that. You know, Jesus comes in uh, as the humble king, as the one who is not trying to overthrow uh, uh, the Roman Empire with military might, which is why you, what you would expect if somebody comes in on a horse, right, a big stallion. Uh, I'm coming to show my power, right? Uh, Jesus doesn't do that. Um, and then the people, though, they, they start to say this term. They say, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lord God, Hosanna to the King of Kings, Hosanna, right? It means, oh, save. And the people, right, they are actually like reflecting back on, on a psalm. And, and they're saying, oh, save, oh, save us. Now, we understand that uh, it, for, for most of the folks in Jerusalem, right, most of them, not all of them, because some of them had this, this firsthand touch, this firsthand experience with God where they realized that Jesus was not just about this military political overthrowing, but, but no, there was actually healing of the body. There was actually just, just almost a week before he had, he had raised Lazarus from the dead. Like there was an understanding that his power, his authority, his kingdom was going to be extremely different. But for a lot of them, they were saying, oh, save because of the occupation of the Roman government within Jerusalem. Oh, save us from this tyranny that, that we're in. I know for some of us, you might feel like that right now. Like, oh, save us, God. There is political tyranny that we're in. There's, 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 there's tyranny that it feels like we're always around. We need a savior. We need you to save us from this God. And I think the people were saying, Hosanna, oh, save us, King Jesus, we know you've done this other stuff. We know you've healed. We know you've proclaimed this upside down economy of the kingdom. We know you've done all of that stuff, but we need some more saving. We got to last week where Judas felt like this type of saving that you're doing, Christ, is not enough. There needs to be more. There needs to be more. I want to see this money being used for something else. And since you're not doing it to, to meet my needs, to meet the needs of the larger group of people, I'm just going to start taking it and pocketing it for myself. This issue of Hosanna, of oh save, we ought to make sure that we're really careful and specific about what we're asking the Lord to save us from that his plans of salvation are actually penetrating our hearts so that our plans of salvation can be usurped by his plans for salvation. 
because his salvation will always be total and complete. Our idea of salvation will always be fragmented and in part. And so last week when we looked at Judas, we saw that Jesus' plan for salvation wasn't enough, that Judas actually never made it to the cross, this journey to the cross. He never made it to the cross. He never got to the place where the cross, which is symbolic of this turning point, the symbolic of the of death, symbolic of, of, of where death has to happen so that new life can begin. He never actually made it to that place. He didn't get a chance to get to the other side of the empty tomb where resurrection happens, where new life happens. He, he never even made it to resurrection. He never even made it to the cross. In fact, he got so filled with remorse when he realized his wrongdoing that he actually wasted his confession on people who couldn't change his circumstance. He went back to the chief priest and the rulers and said, I've sinned. I've done wrong. I've betrayed innocent blood. And they said, what that got to do with us? Tell it to the clock. It got more time. That's what they said. It's in your Bible. Judas got to this place where Jesus wasn't enough. This was, this was his journey to the cross, but he never made it there. And today we're going to look at another one of Jesus' disciples as an example for us who actually did make it to the cross, but, but serves as a beautiful human example for us. Remember, the folks that God gives us as examples in the scripture are not meant to be idolized. They're not meant to be placed on some pedestal where we say, oh, they never did wrong. No, the reason why God gives us these, these individuals in the scriptures is so that we can find ourselves in those individuals. They're not saints because they have been so holy and perfect. They're saints like the rest of the believers because they have been set apart by God, for God's purposes, not for anything in and of themselves that they have done. And so we get to this place today where we talk about good old Peter. Peter, Simon, the fisherman. A couple things to remember about Simon. Yeah, he was a fisherman. That was his trade. I, I remember back even, uh, I talk about a lot of the, the hard things that, that I had growing up, but there were some like really fun things that I remember uh, about being with my dad growing, growing up. And one of the things that my dad loved to do was he loved to fish. And, and, and we would go fishing and he would take me fishing. And it was one of the places where he would really be like at peace. It would be a different, a different type of of, of experience with him and, and, and he would he would take me out and we would learn I would learn how to bait the the, the hook and cast the line and and uh, and it was one of the times where he was really patient with me. It was weird, right? Uh, but then my dad also loved to go sea fishing. And for how many have ever been deep sea fishing? Okay, a few of you will understand the nauseating feeling <laughs> Um, that comes with deep sea fishing. It's not the same as fishing off of a bank, you know, and you got to go out super, super early in the morning at like 3 a.m. I don't know why do fish just not, why, what, do they sleep and is it easier to catch? I, I don't know. Maybe it's because of the, the water is not as, as, as turbulent. I, I don't know. I read in the scriptures at night, there was all kinds of storms at night. I, I don't understand why we got to get up so early for this, but, but I would often, I believe, be brought along on the deep sea fishing trips because I would often provide the chum for the water so that the fish could actually come. I'm realizing that that's really the reason why I was bought on the trip. That's, I know that's that, that face, that's the same thing. And uh, what is chum? What is chum? Some people are saying, uh, ask your neighbor with the scrunch, they can tell you what Chum was. Peter was a fisherman. This was a part of what he did, but he was also one of the three closest disciples of Jesus. 
Peter, James, and John, these three were the closest. They had the most intimate experiences out of all the disciples with Jesus. Peter was the only disciple, the only other person in the world outside of Jesus to ever walk on water. We don't know of anybody else that have walked on water. Maybe David Copperfield, maybe Houdini, maybe they did some tricks like that, but there's no record of it. Peter, we've got a record of him actually walking on water. Nobody else did that. Peter was with Jesus when he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He was there. He was present. He was in the room. Peter was in the garden of Gethsemane in the Mount of Olives. He was with Jesus and, and James and John, Peter, James and John, these three, they were together. They were there in the intimate spaces. Jesus asked them, he said, would you pray with me for a while? And he was there falling asleep, but he was there. And when the people came to arrest Jesus, Peter was the one that stood up not rightly, but stood up, nevertheless, took his sword and sliced off the ear of one of the attendants. And Jesus said, away with that and healed the man's ear, even as he was being arrested. But Peter was right there. Peter was in the intimate circle of Jesus. He was there at the times when Jesus was at his lowest and even at his highest. And so today we're going to look at Peter and his own journey to the cross because like all of us, Peter had a journey. He had to get to the place of the cross. He had to get to the place of crucifixion, of death. There was a death that needed to happen, but resurrection also needed to happen for Peter because God had a plan. So Peter has to experience this. It's no accident that Peter is the one out of all the disciples. When Jesus asked them, he says, who do people say I am? And they all began to talk and amongst each other and and whisper some things and mutter some things. And then they said, well, some say some say that you are the prophet. Some say that you are like Elijah and, you know, incarnate. Some say you like John. They, they, They just they listed all these different things. And then he said, well, well, who do you say I am? And Peter, being filled with the Holy Spirit, said, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. And Jesus responds, he says, blessed are you, Simon Peter, blessed are you, Peter, upon this truth that you have just said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Peter is critical. I want you to know something, y'all. You are critical. You are critical. You are critical to God's plans. You matter to God's agenda. Don't think for a second that you don't matter. You're on a journey. I'm on a journey. We all got to get to that cross point because there's a death that needs to happen because on the other side is new life. So we got to let some things die. So we're going to look at Peter in three different ways. His prediction Jesus gives to him his denial and then his restoration. So we'll look at this first through the prediction. Now, I'm going to read a few texts and we're going to jump around a bit. So I just want you to know that and we're going to jump around a bit. So they'll be on the screen for sure. But what I encourage you to do uh, is for today, especially, I encourage you as we lead up to this week of resurrection of Easter Sunday, I encourage you to at least write the text down. You don't have to write all the words, but just write the reference of the text down so that this week you can actually go back and look at these in a particular order. So we're going to look at this prediction. Number one, the prediction. Jesus warns. Everybody say that. Jesus warns. Jesus warns us when things are about to go sideways. If you remember when we were in the series on Joseph and, um, and we talked about the, the famine that, that happened and even 
uh, a few years ago when we were looking at uh, the story of Ruth and how that famine came. Famine or emptiness never sneaks up on us. It never comes out of nowhere. Famine always, there's always a warning. There's always signs. There's always a digression that leads to being in famished. Jesus, in his grace, warns us. He gives us indication. Hey, some things are about to happen. You might need to rethink some things. I want you to get ready. Jesus is always warning. And so what does he do? He warns Peter that in your journey to the cross, Peter, in your journey to understanding really, really, really who I am and really, really what I came to do, Peter, I'm warning you that you are going to experience failure. You're going to experience some hurt. So Jesus warns him. Matthew chapter 26. We're going to look at three different experts in the Gospels that share this kind of progression, this, this progression of what happened. This was at the Last Supper. Jesus had already washed the disciples' feet. Judas was included in that. He already bathed them. He already anointed them. He, he, he had prayed for them. He had spent time with them. He having this meal with them. This is at this intimate time of fellowship. And here's this progression that happens. Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 31. Here's what it says. Then Jesus told them, this very night, you will all fall away on account of me. Notice the language that Jesus is saying. This is to his disciples, the folks that are in the room, the folks that he's breaking bread with, the folks that he just washed their feet. He's with them and he's saying, listen, all of y'all going to fall away from me tonight. He's warning. Something is going to happen. He says, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter, Peter is ready. Shoot, aim. He always is ready to fire it off. What? No, not me. I'm ready. Let's just jump it off right here. We ain't got to talk no more, y'all. Let's just get to the action. This is Peter's motive. And even as Jesus has just declared, all of y'all, listen, you saw me. You've seen me do miraculous work. You've seen me do all of these things. You've seen me prophesy. You've seen me heal. You've seen, I ain't never been wrong in your presence. All of y'all going to fall away. But Peter, like most of us, is like, no, huh? come on, dude. You must be crazy. He says, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Peter's like, I got your back. Jesus is like, it ain't my back I'm worried about. It's my front. You got my front? <laughs> Luke 22. The conversation continues. Verse 31. Simon, Simon. After Simon, Peter has just said this. He says, listen, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. Notice, listen, we talked about this a few weeks ago. Notice Notice what Jesus says about Satan. We need to, listen, we need to have a theology of Satan. Because we walk around here like Satan got all power. It's a lie. Satan is not all powerful. Satan is, 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 is not all present. Satan cannot be here and there at the same time. It's not possible. There's demonic forces that Satan has rule over. But listen to what Jesus says. He says, Peter, Satan has come to me asking permission from me if, I, if he can touch you. 
Notice, y'all, that Satan has to go to Christ for permission for an attack to happen. Remember that with Job? We just talked about this. Job in the whole story, right? Job doing all the good stuff. Satan comes to make his report along with the angelic host. And God Almighty, creator of the universe, says, have you considered my servant Job? Satan's like, why should I? You're protecting him. I, he essentially was saying, I can't do anything as long as you are protecting him. Satan comes to Christ and says, can I get to Peter? And it's not because he has all knowledge either. He's not omniscient. But Satan observes and Satan sees, oh, there's a group of three that are really close to Jesus. And it seems like this one dude, I know there's the other God that, that he really loves. I know, I know that, that John dude, I, I, yeah, we gonna get to him, but this Peter, it seems like, I, can, can I get to him? Satan can't put an attack on you, on me, unless God says green light. And if God says green light, if God says yes to it, then we know it is always, even if we can't comprehend it, even if it doesn't make sense, even if it doesn't feel good, it is always for our good. Always, unless God's a liar. It's one of the two. There's no middle ground. There's no gray area. Either God says, yes, he's in your hand, she's in your hand, but trust me, you got limitations on what you can do because they're mine. And I'm doing this for their good, for the good of others around them so that there can be a testimony of how I defeat you. Yeah, Come on. God gives permission, not because he's trying to destroy us, because he's trying to use us as examples for how his glory can be exercised in the vessels of broken people. Satan says, I want to sift you. Jesus replies, but I have prayed for you, Simon. Listen to what he says, that your faith may not fail. Jesus knows because he is all powerful. He's all knowledgeable. He knows that Peter is going to fail, but he's praying that his faith, what is faith? It's the substance of things hoped for. He's praying that the substance of what you're hoping for, that that doesn't fail in the midst, come on, in the midst of your own physical failure. We can experience, y'all, physical defeat, physical failure. And God is saying, but I don't want your faith to fail. I don't want your, your understanding of who I am in the midst of your brokenness to fail. You're going to fail. You're going to drop the ball. You're going to experience persecution. You're going to experience infighting with your own families. You're going to experience all that kind of stuff. But I don't want your faith to fail. He says, I've prayed for you. And then he says, listen, and when you have turned back, glory to God, he's letting Peter know in advance, you're going to experience something, man. You've been with me. You're going to experience some brokenness. I'm praying that your faith doesn't fail. And listen, when you are restored, when you are turned back, when you pass over from crucifixion, from Calvary, from cross to empty tomb, to resurrection, when you've passed over that, I want you to go back and strengthen your brothers. They're going to need it. You are needed for God. You're needed. Whatever you might be going through, whatever you might be facing, if something is coming down the line for you, I'm telling you, God has allowed it to happen 
so that he can work through our weakness so that his name can be glorified. Verse 33, but he replied, (laughs) even after all that, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. He is zealous. And that's us. A lot of times we're zealous. Like, no, I'm, I'm with, look, ain't nobody going to take me away from my Jesus. Nobody. Ain't nobody getting in front of me and my God. I know the question is, are you going to get in the way of you and your Jesus? Am I, Kevin, are you getting in the way? Because I don't, it ain't about everybody else. What are you doing to get in the way? Mark chapter 14, verse 30. The conversation continues. Verse 30, here's Jesus replying, truly I tell you, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. How many of y'all ever been around roosters when they crow? When they, whatever they do, I don't know if they crow, whatever that is, whatever. Ain't no country folks in here. Ain't nobody been in the country. I know some, I, you country. I know you, you country. I know. We, y'all know like the succession that roosters like a doodle do. Like it's, it's pretty quick. Like it ain't, it ain't never like just one by itself. Like it, it's a sequence, right? Jesus says, listen, before this rooster crows twice, before he gets two out, you're going to deny me three times. Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And it wasn't just him. Everybody else in the room. Yep, yeah, yeah, no. Nah, not nah, all of it. Guess who was still in the room? Judas. Judas. He hadn't been dismissed yet. I, no, no, I'm, I'm, look, I'm willing to go to the ends. Have you ever been associated with Jesus? We're all open to satanic attack. Jesus lets Peter know, listen, the attack is coming, man. It's coming. I want you to be prepared. It's coming. But the attack is not going to destroy you because I've prayed for you. I've lifted you up. See, what I was saying earlier about when we're physically under attack and then the mourners just start to come around and we ain't even dead. You know, Jesus didn't have this ability, right? But what if, what if Jesus was like, yeah, Peter, man, Satan came to ask me to sift you like wheat. Essentially, that, that's an idiom. It just means to, like, to separate you, to pull you apart. He, he's come and asked me, and that man, I'm, I'm really sorry, but you you ain't gonna make it, dude. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just sorry. Like I, yeah, it's a defeatist attitude. Jesus doesn't take that, take that, that road. He he understands this is not permanent. This is temporary. Sometimes, and we know this. Though failure is regrettable, it can be regrettable, it doesn't have to be, but it can be difficult. Though, though, though it's real, sometimes our greatest successes come out of failures. Our greatest victories can come out of a failure, of a, something like, I, man, I, I didn't do that right. I, 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 I did that wrong. I was hurtful or I, I, I misjudged that or whatever, whatever that might be. Like you, 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 if you can learn from it, if you can grow from it, then maybe greater success, maybe greater faithfulness can come out. So there's the, the prediction. Let's look at the denial that we looked at some of it, but let's look at the denial. And I want to look at it in three different, again, versions. First in John chapter 18. John chapter 18. Starting in verse 15, here's what it says. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus because the disciple 
was known to be, was known, uh, known to the high priest. This is John. John is talking about himself. He does that a lot in his gospel. The one that Jesus loved, right? You know. He went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, yes, I am. I sure is what you got to say about it. It's me. Yup. He told me, he told me this was going to happen. He warned me this was going to happen. It wasn't even two hours ago. He warned me this was going to happen. Yes, it's me. What you going to do about it? I'm, a, yeah, I'm ready. Take me in too. That don't say that in your, mm-mm. I am not. Very plainly, let's move on. (laughs) It was cold and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with himself, warming at the fire. I'm telling y'all, listen, this is a real example. This is why I love the scriptures in the people that God highlights for us. I believe this is a real example of someone who loved Jesus but was terrified was scared. All of a sudden, like all of a sudden, stuff got real. This is, this is what he was talking about. I don't don't know. Listen, we've all been there. Let's be honest. So it gives us a way to see ourselves in the text. Drop down to verse 25. Meanwhile, Simon Peter, Simon Peter stood warming himself. So they asked him, you aren't one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. Very plain, very simple, straightforward. One of the high priest's servants, a relative, listen, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off not hours ago. This dude's cousin whose ear got cut off and Jesus healed. He's looking at Peter. Dude, you the dude that cut my cousin ear off. I saw him on. It was night, but it wasn't that dark. I saw you. We had torches. There was light. I saw you. He says, weren't you one of them? Didn't I see you with them in the garden? Verse 27, again, again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. But there's even a better version of this. Look, oh no, it's not, that's not it. Let's go to the next one. Mark, Mark chapter 14. Then we got one more to look at. Mark chapter 14. Skip over to that one. Mark chapter 14, begin in verse 66. Here's what it says. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. So she's examining. She ain't like, like, oh, what? Do you look like one? No, she came up, got in his grill. She looked closely at him. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely. You also were with the Nazarene Jesus, she said, but he denied it. She didn't even ask him. She said, you was with him. I don't know or understand <laughs> what you're talking about. <laughs> I don't know it. I don't, I, I don't comprehend the words that are coming out of your mouth. <laughs> this is us, y'all. This is us. Don't get it twisted. This ain't Peter. This is us. Just put yourself in this. He says, where I'm at? Where I'm at? 60, uh, 68. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, so she followed him. <laughs> she again said to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. She ain't asking no questions, y'all. She just said, he is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you are Galilean. He began to call down curses. If y'all think the Bible don't curse, y'all, it's, it's, it, just, just get creative in your mind. Like what He began to call them all down, all stuff that y'all said, I know. He began to call curses down, and he swore to them. I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately, the rooster crowed the second time. Then 
Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Luke 22. Then look at verse 44. Luke 22, verse 44. I hope y'all writing this down. Some of y'all be like, I'm going to go back and listen. You're a lie. You ain't going back. You're going you're, you're gonna to get all crazy. You're going to be like, oh, oh, I forgot. I, write, I'm telling you, write these down. Y'all laughing because you know it's true. That's why y'all love me. Verse 54, then seizing him, they led him away. This is Jesus. And took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight, in the firelight, in the firelight she saw. This wasn't in the dark. He was sitting by the fire. In the light, she could see clearly who he was. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him, but he denied it. Woman! <laughs> you notice how each of these versions, like there's a little bit of different emphasis, right? <laughs> Luke, who is more the human, he's the more human guy out of all of the out of all the gospel writers. He says, Woman, I don't know him. 58. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not. <laughs> he going straight shaggy on him, wasn't me. What? But I saw you in the court. Yeah, wasn't me. <laughs> Some of y'all got that. 59, about an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Listen, listen. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed, 61. It's the only place where we see this. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows the day, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. All of us have been in a situation where we have sinned. We've done wrong. We have done some type of evil. We missed the mark. We've, we've not done something that we were supposed to do, or we've done some things that we we're not supposed to do. We, we've all been in that place. And, and if we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, almost immediately when that happens, we get this sense of conviction from the Lord as if he's looking directly at us. And I think this is what Peter felt because he was intimate with Christ. He he had shared intimate times with him, times when Jesus was crying out, he was pouring out, times when he saw him at his lowest, at his most vulnerable. He was on the inside, and, and yet and still, he denies, but I think even more than a denial, he realizes that I failed. He can't remember right now the rest of the words that Jesus said, but listen, you're going to fail, but, but I've prayed that your faith doesn't fail. He, he can't comprehend that right now. He's filled with bitterness, with remorse, with regret. He's weeping bitterly. And something has to happen. And here's where it happens. This little bit of a preview of the restoration. This is like we're skipping over right now the cross. So the cross has happened. Jesus has died. He's been placed in a tomb. The people have come to anoint his body. The tomb is empty. Peter is nowhere to be found. He's with the brothers. They're weeping. They're mourning. 
because all they can see is the reality of what happened, not the promise of what Jesus said. They can see the reality of what happened. Come on, y'all. They can see the reality of what happened, but not what Jesus has promised. That's us. We can see sometimes the reality of what's going on. I can see this in the flesh. I can see that this person, all they're doing is, is stirring up things. They're making everything bad for the community. I can see my family, this family, my spouse don't get me. Don't. I can see that. I can see that reality, but fail to see the promise that God has. Peter's the disciples, they're mourning, they're weeping. All they can see is the crucifixion. All they can see is Calvary. They can't see anything else. Mark chapter 16, verse 1, when the Sabbath was over, got to love the women in the scriptures. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Who's going to push it away, y'all? We can't do it. But when they looked up, oh, God says, look up, lift your eyes up. When they looked up right there, they saw that the stone, the obstacle, the obstruction that blocked our way into promise, that obstacle was removed. It was large. It had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. Listen to what he says. Don't be alarmed. Fear not. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene who was crucified. He is risen. He ain't here. He ain't here. But listen, I love this. See the place where they laid him. This is the evidence Verse seven, but go tell his disciples and Peter, <laughs> glory to God, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Why the distinction of Peter? Why would the angel of the Lord have to make that distinction? Peter was a disciple. He could have just said, tell the disciples. Why? Because Peter and you and me are critical. You're critical to God's plan. You are in the group. You are a part of a group. But there's something of assignment that's a little bit different that God has for you. Not higher, not lower, different. Somebody else got a different assignment. God needs them for something, but he needs Peter right now. He needs Peter. He needs to make a distinction. Why? Because Peter was the one who denied in front of everybody. Peter was the one who said, I will die with you. Jesus already died. Peter's still alive. He ain't been raised from the dead. He's still filled with regret. So Jesus has to go out of his way and say, listen, go, angel, tell them I need everybody to come. Meet me at the place where I told them. But listen, get Peter too. I need Peter. And Peter is critical. I need him. Get him. You put your name. You're critical. God needs you. He needs you. He needs you. Yeah, he needs other people. But right now he's saying, I need you for this assignment. Whatever the assignment is that God has, whatever's been burning in your heart, whatever that thing is, God say, I need you. I want you. Jesus has this plan. Here's where we'll finish. Resurrection happens. Jesus spends all these days with them. He, he comes to the disciples at the beach. He sees them fishing. They've been fishing all night. Ain't catch nothing. Nothing. Jesus already on this. He, he, he already got stuff set up. 
tells him, throw, throw the net on the other side. What? She, All right, whatever. Do it on the other side. Jesus got stuff set up. He, he got, they bring all the stuff in. Peter's there. He sits down with them. They begin to break bread. And he says, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know, you know, you know I love you. You know I, I, I love you. Peter, I want you to feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. You know I love you. Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Significant, y'all. Three times he asked him, why? Three times there was a denial. I, I, I need to usurp your failure with my success for you, with my plan. You're still stuck, Peter. And I'm giving you a chance right now to declare your love. I know you love me, but I need you to confess it. I need you to say it because there's power in your confession. And as you say that, my plan is going to usurp your failure. I pray that your faith not fail. He asked them these three times and Peter is sparked. They get to the upper room. Peter, the main disciple who starts to preach and share this good news to all the people there. He starts to give the word of the Lord. He's zealous. He's on fire for the Lord. He still got issues. He still has to grow. We see that in the book of Acts, but he's preaching. He's doing his stuff. God is using him. And then towards the end of his days, this is where we're close. Peter writes a letter to, to some churches. He's reflecting on his life. He's reflecting on his past failures, where he dropped the ball and how the Lord pulled him back. In 1 Peter chapter 5, he says these words. He says, think about this. Listen, think about this in light of what Peter has been through, not just the words themselves and how I can attach that to me. Yeah, it's for us. But think about Peter writing these words in light of what he has gone through. He says... Humble yourselves. Humble yourselves, therefore. Why humble yourselves? Because Peter was zealous. There was times when he lacked humility. He was like, I'm, a, I'm doing this. And Jesus was like, pump your brakes. I need you to humble yourself. You're not yet what you are meant to be, Peter, but I have prayed for you. Peter, now towards the end of his life says, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Peter is reflecting on how in due time God lifted him up, but he had to go to the cross. Something in Peter had to die. He says this, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Whatever anxiety that we're carrying, he says, listen, share it with me. I care. When you give it to other people who don't care about you, you're wasting your confession on people who can't change your circumstance. Give it to me because I care for you. He says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Peter understood that because Jesus told him, Satan has come to me. The devourer has come to me asking if he can take you out. Peter is reflecting on this. He says, resist him. Resist him. The devil, resist the satanic attacks, resist the, the, the things of the flesh, resist those things. He says, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you into his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a while, Peter is reflecting. He's remembering his own suffering. He says, after 
you suffer a while. I know because I've been there. I know what it feels like. I know what it's like to suffer, to fail, to drop the ball, to sin. I know what it's like. He says, after you've suffered a little while, Christ himself will restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. He will do it. And he says to him, be the power forever and ever. Amen. That is the word of the Lord, y'all. Come on, stand together. That's good news. That's good news, y'all. That's good news. Whatever it is that you're going through, it's not a surprise to God. He's already warned you. He's saying, listen, the enemy is going to try to take you out. You're going to drop the ball. You're going to miss the mark. But don't let your faith in me fail. I have a plan for you. I need you. I know there's some theology out there that says God doesn't need you. He don't need you. I would dare to say that our understanding of need is jacked up. We think it's a need like, I need you like, if you don't do it, then ain't nobody, it's never going to happen. That's not the kind of need God has for us. God wouldn't have put you on this planet if he didn't need you. If he didn't have a plan for you, you would not exist. Father, we thank you so much that you have a plan. That even through our failures, even through a sinning of being hurtful, even through all of those things, God, you have a plan for restoration. It includes us confessing those things, having godly remorse, which leads to repentance. And so lead us, God, with godly remorse, that we would actually repent, we would turn away from our sinfulness, and we would turn back towards you whatever way you desire for us, God. Help us to do that. We pray that every person in here, God, whether they're online, whether they're in this place right now, that they would feel this tug from you that says, I've got a plan for you, but I need you to get to the cross. I need you to journey to the cross so that I can kill those things in you that are keeping you from life with me. We pray that every person would do that right now by your spirit, in their way, according to your will. We pray this now in the matchless name of your son, Jesus, who is the Christ. And we all said together, amen. And amen. I pray that this was good news for you. I pray that this was good news for you. Go in peace. Enjoy your day.